I came out here to make a raft out of driftwood and fish the ocean, but it's way too rough out there. There's white caps, so I came out here for nothing. So I think I'm going to change it up completely, head to Bass Pro, and get everything I need from scratch to show any beginner fisherman how to fish fresh water. We're going to the mountains again. I'm really trying to see if I can get everything I need to start trout fishing for less than $100. So many rods, where do you even start from? So the main thing I'm looking for is something with a full metal body. And I don't want it to have any line on it because we're gonna buy line anyway. Something kind of small, like five and a half foot to six and a half foot. This would be nice, but it's a hundred bucks. This one looks good. It's five foot six, sixty-four dollars. I like it small because you could break it down, put it in your backpack, and you don't have to worry about getting broke by tree branches and stuff like that. The reel is all metal. It's got a good action. I can fish for trout, bass, all kinds of fish with this thing. All right, next thing is fishing line. Pretty standard. You can go either four pound or six pound to start out with fishing for trout, and you can find out how much line your reel can fit right on the reel itself. So 110 yards of four pound, 85 yards of six pound. Now when you're filling your fishing spool with line, you wanna fill it with monofilament. Make sure the package says monofilament because if it's fluorocarbon, although it has very good abrasion resistance, it has very low memory, so it's just gonna spring off your spool. This stuff is pretty cheap, $6.99. Now weights. There's so much stuff, it could be a little intimidating coming in here, but if you know what you're looking for, it's not so bad. The weights you want to get when you're starting off are split shots. If you can find kind of a variety pack like this, that would be great, but these are kind of big. We don't want those. You don't want your split shots too big or else it'll sink too fast. You'd rather get them small, and if they're small, you can add more if you need. I personally like about this size, and I like them with this clamp on the back of the weight so you can take them on and off. I'll grab that. 449. Here I'll grab a pack of size 10 or 8 bait holder hooks. Now a good go-to bait would be an artificial spinner or rooster tail. Something like this and I prefer a black and yellow pattern to mimic a bumblebee. I'll go with this one here, 5.99, 1 8 ounce. Now I'm gonna get a Panther Martin, pretty proven lure. I like that same color, 5.19, 1 8 ounce black and yellow. Now we're really gonna to try to increase our chances, so we're gonna get some, some worms, some night crawlers. If there's none in those refrigerators up front, we haven't had any for a while. Might not have night crawlers here, so we'll get those somewhere else. Well, the total came out to be $90, $97 after tax. I'm sure we could catch fish like this, but we're gonna make it easy on us because we're beginners today. We'll get the night crawlers, make this a sure thing. Before I go fishing, I've gotta put the line on the spool Sometimes this is not quite as easy as it looks. Sometimes these reels will have a piece of rubber and that helps the line really stick. If you don't have a piece of rubber or something to hold that line, sometimes it can just start spinning. So it's really important to put something on there before you spool it. Most of the time your line will come with a little piece of tape like that, or you could even use the sticker from the spool if you don't have any tape laying around. I'm putting that tape right there on the spool. Now when I put line on a new spool, I'll put the line through the first guide. I'll tie a simple overhand knot going twice through the loop. I'll cut off or bite off that excess just past the knot. And then I'll tie a slip knot with that tag end with the overhand knot we just tied on the open side. Make sure you open your bail before you attach your line. Hopefully you can see that. You see that tag end there? As I pull it tight, the tag end gets tight and it gets caught on that last little knot. That'll hold everything in place. Close the bale. And now the most important part of spooling your reel. You can tell that the line comes off the spool this way. I'm going to make sure that it's going onto the reel the same way that it's coming off. And now with a small rag or towel, I'll hold the line against the rod to give it some tension and reel. This will also warm up the line and get a new memory to form around the reel. The line pops right off the spool, doesn't get tangled, goes right on the reel. Finish spooling and that's how the line looks. If anything, that might be a little bit overfilled. You don't want to go more than that. You should have a line holder on most reels. Just go from the top, work your way under, and your line will stay put. This is nice too, because when you fish, you can tie directly to your line. You don't have to tie any leaders. 
so we'll be fishing tomorrow. It's the next day. My wife's got a little worm farm growing, so I got about six or seven earthworms. And how I found this spot, I just looked up the city where I'm from, looked on the freshwater fishing maps, and you find out the river that you want to fish, search that name up. Let's go through it together, actually. All right, let's say you're trying to find a new fishing spot, a new river in California. I like to start off going to Google Maps. Now, zoom out in California, and I'd like to start on satellite view. So let's say for this example, maybe your family wants to go to Tahoe. They're taking Highway 80, going to Tahoe. Maybe they'll stop by Truckee. You can a lot of the times look at the lakes, and there should be some uh, rivers feeding the lake. So let's go to a place where there's not so much traffic. Stampede Reservoir. And now what lake, what river is feeding Stampede Reservoir? Some creeks. How about what's going out of Stampede Reservoir? This is Little Truckee River going out of Stampede Reservoir. So we want to fish the Little Truckee River. So then we'll go to the 2024 Freshwater Regulations book. And we will search for, let's look for the Little Truckee. There it is. Little Truckee. We've got only one regulation, and this is is from Stampede Reservoir Dam, that's what we just saw, downstream to Boca Reservoir. Open all year, but you can't keep any trout here. Boca Reservoir. So in this example, we're just going to try to go fly fishing. So we'll type in Boca Reservoir. Oh, way down there, huh? What? It's a little trucky. Boca Reservoir is over here, though. That don't make no... Oh, here's Little Truckee also. There's a Little Truckee. So from this reservoir, downstream to Boca Reservoir, fishing is open all year, but you can't keep any trout. And that's just what you got to look for. And you could also do this vice versa. If the season is closed, you can look for a spot where, let's say, for example... It's open all year. You can only use artificial lures, but you can keep two trout. In that case, we're going to have to look for Kitchen Creek, upstream of Lake Marina and all its tributaries. And that's how you find your fishing spots. So chances are, when you find out where you're going to go, you're going to be going down some forest roads. And they might look good from the start, but most likely they're going to turn into some dirt, gravel, steep roads. So you might want to be prepared with a proper car or vehicle. But that's where all the fun happens. So exploring new places. Let's go down to the river. I've never been here before. Make sure your car has enough gas too, because sometimes the river is about five miles from the entrance of the forest road, but it takes about an hour to get down there because it's so steep and windy. That's the case with this one. There's also a high chance that you won't have any cell phone reception, so be prepared with that. Also, of course, bring some food, water, or at least a water filter. Woohoo! Probably going to see a lot of wildlife too. I just saw a deer jump by and with the cases from Sacramento, those two brothers who got attacked by mountain lions, you might see some of those too. So you want to be prepared, whether it's with bear spray or a firearm. See that gate behind me? It's closed and that's the only way to get to the river where I can keep fish. Trout season in California typically opens the last Saturday of every April, and it's not quite there yet. So there are certain streams and rivers that have special rules where you can fish all year or at different times of the year. And this happened to be one of them where I could keep two fish. But the only access point to this one is closed. So I'm gonna pull out the forestry map, see if there's any more forest roads that go down to the river. And if I can't find anything, I'll pick up the regulation book and look for any other rivers around the area and hopefully there's something where I can keep a fish or two. Dang. Took me a while, but I finally found a spot to fish and there are bumblebees everywhere. Perfectly matches my lure. And normally I don't like to fish the first stream I see on the trail. 
but the pressure seems pretty low, so I'm going to give it a try with one of those bumblebee spinners. One thing to look for when you get started fishing, the fish are usually hanging where all the white water is, right on the edges of the water. That's where the water is most oxygenated, and that's where they can target bugs and floating insects that are floating downstream, and they'll just eat them, go back to their calm spot, eat them all day. That's where I'm targeting. Bail open, so when I close it, I can't pull the line out. But I'll open it and feed it through the guides. I'm gonna try this MEPS lure first. It's got the bumblebee pattern, but it's also got an egg imitation. So they might attack that just on instinct. Sometimes salmon, steelhead, or even trout will bite incoming eggs coming down river just to eliminate competition and increase the chances that their genetics get passed down from generation to generation. Good idea to cut off or bite off about a foot of line just to make sure you eliminate any frays that would break if you get a fish. Now a lot of people will attach a snap swivel and then attach the lure, but that's not the best way to attach these spinners. You want to tie directly to the spinner. I'm tying a fisherman's knot, aka clinch knot, to the lure with six wraps. You want this blade to spin, not the entire lure. If the lure spins, the blade won't be as efficient as possible. Of course, cut off the extra line. Before you cast, you always want to check your drag. You got six pound test, so you want to make sure the line comes off the reel at about one or two pounds, because every run from the fish is going to put immediate pressure on the line. If it's too tight, your line will break and you'll be so disappointed. Now I want to cast it upstream. And as soon as it hits the water, I want to start retrieving it real slowly while it drifts down. I've only got two lures, so I don't want to let it sink too deep or I run the risk of losing this, getting snagged on a rock, which will happen a lot. You might not catch a fish for a while. Don't get discouraged, just move on to the next hole. There's thousands of them. When you're about to cast your lure, you want it about one half to one third distance of your rod away from the tip. So I'm gonna reel it up. The next thing you wanna do is bring this part where the line is being held on the reel as close to the handle as possible. And you grab it with the tip of your finger between the crease and the tip. You don't want it in the crease or it'll get stuck there. Now the most important part, open the bail. That's probably the biggest beginner mistake, casting with the bail closed and then you break off your lure and it's so frustrating. Next thing you do, just load up the rod, swing it like you're swinging a baseball bat, release the finger as you let it go, close the bail when it hits the water, and start your retrieve. Do that about a thousand times and you'll be a pro. The water's flowing really fast here, so I don't think this eighth ounce spinner is able to get down to where the fish are. I'm gonna keep on moving, and find some more shallow areas. And when I get to a new spot, I typically start fishing at the tail end of the river because all the fish are pointed upstream looking for food. I don't want to start at the top and then spook everything behind it. I want to start at the bottom and then I can eventually sneak up to the top where they haven't seen my lure at all. There was a fish following that. If I can get another follower, I might just change to the Panther Martin. Small fish following it again. This is something you might have to deal with also. I just casted and got this huge wind knot. So I pulled the tangle out as far as I could. And man, this is tangled bad. I might have to just cut it and re-thread it and put on another lure. You know what would have helped maybe? Maybe a snap swivel. That would have taken out the twists in the line and it still would have allowed the lure to spin. So maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'll use a lure on and off with a snap swivel. Look at all this. You know, I could spend 45 minutes trying to untangle this and maybe not even untangle it, or I could spend three minutes cutting it, re-threading it, putting a new bait on. And sometimes when you're out here, you just want to fish. So I'm, that's what I'm going to do. Big hazard for animals and fish. So definitely want to throw that away and don't leave it on the ground. Changing it up to the Panther Martin. So that whole line tangle could have been prevented by doing this. When you cast out, keep your hand right over the spool, right till it hits the water and then stop it. Put that line tight back on the, on the reel. And that way, the wind won't blow it off and you won't have that big backlash on the spinning reel. I 
I'm a little rusty trout fishing. It's been a while. It's coming back to me now. Cast, close it, put it right back on there. It'll be good every time. Even if your line has a bunch of twists in it. Oh, fish, fish, fish on! Woo, baby! Little guy. Little guy, the Panther Martin coming through. Now when you catch a fish, always a good idea. Wet your hands. That way the trout slime coat, which is their protective coat, won't come off. Small trout. Nice looking little fish. But too small to eat. So I'm gonna pop it off. Little fish. Boop. See you later. We're looking for about a size 12 or bigger. Panther Martin versus Meps. Panther Martin all day. It's pretty cool. Got that follower to bite. 15 minutes here, I'll move to the next spot. All right, so this is a really deep pool. I'm about to switch to the worm, but before I do, I want to give this spinner a shot at fishing the deep water. And since I'm at the end of the run and I fished it all with this, I can be a little bit more risky and put some weight on it. So about one and a half foot above the lure, which is the same distance above the worm that I would put the weights, I'm gonna put three split shots and see what happens. Now you could bring some pliers or you could smash this between two rocks, but I'll just do this the way I've been doing it for like 20 years. Put the line through the split shot and give it a little bite. I don't think I'll get lead poisoning from this. Three split shots above the spinner and we'll cast out a few more times with this. All right, fish following it. I might need to go a little bit deeper, maybe two more split shots. Yeah, I'm gonna add two more split shots, get down a little deeper. There's fish on. Woo. Oh, it came off. Dang. Wasn't that big though. I'm gonna add another two more split shots, so that's gonna make a total of seven. Usually you would never do this, but the water is so deep and you gotta fish the water. Don't be afraid to go heavy if you need to. Another thing that could be helpful when you get a bite, since most of these fish are fish are uh, facing upstream, when you get a bite, set it downstream and it'll go into their mouths rather than out of their mouths. That's just what some people talk about at least. Well, only that one bite. I got my worm, no worm threader. And you just wanna get your worm on as much as you can. And I like to start with the hard end and I'll just thread it on. When you're satisfied where the worm is, just get the hook out a little bit. So the hook tip is exposed and there's your presentation. All right, one split shot and one worm. Cast out as far as I can. Only one split shot because I'm not retrieving. I'm trying to let the worm drift as close to the bottom as possible without retrieving it. So it needs to sink down, but also drift down. As it drifts down towards you, you want to reel it in, just keeping tension, reducing the slack. Just in case you do get a bite, you can set the hook. Sometimes it's windy and it'll create a bow in your line. So you might not be able to feel the fish. So watch the line, let that be your indicator. That one split shot might be a little light. I'm adding one more. It's always adjustments. It's always finding the right thing to do in the right conditions. And then finally, eventually, halfway or end of the day, you'll figure it out and you'll start catching fish. Fish on. Fish on, baby. Is it a keeper? Looks decent. Woo, we letting that thing drift down. This might just be a keeper. I think we can keep that one. Let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Oh, we're just letting it drift super slow. Oh, that's a nice looking fish. It's a nice looking fish. Wet my hands, bring them up. Don't let them wiggle free. I'm trying to keep them in the water. I don't have a net. Right there, baby. Nice fish. Really nice one. 
perfect eater size. That's about 11, 12 inches. Added the extra split shot. And this place, I never thought you could keep fish, but every year they change regulations on certain areas. So just keep up to date because this year you might not be able to fish it until the, first, the last weekend of April. Next year you could fish it all year. So just keep an eye on that. I'm gonna dispatch him, keep him in the water to stay fresh, try to catch another one. Woo, let's go. That's a nice fish right there. Just to make sure he doesn't wiggle away, I'm gonna bonk him on the head. Now he won't go anywhere. And I don't really think this matters too much for freshwater fish, but while his heart's beating, it wouldn't hurt. I'm gonna cut its gills and they'll start bleeding out. Now I'll take a stick that has a Y on it, and I'll just shove it into the sand in here. Now we've got our lunch. It'll stay fresh in the cool water. Let's see if we can get another one and really try to have a nice lunch. Oh, snagged. All right, I guess we'll cover this topic because you always get snagged when you're fishing. You get snagged, try to pop it off a few times. Sometimes it'll come off, but it's really hard when you're using six pound test or four pound test. So once you decide you can't get it out from any angles, no matter how many times you pop it off, just reel as much as you can. Hold the spool on the reel and just pull back and you might get lucky and get it off, which I did, or it might break and you'll have to retie. So that's the technique to undo a snag. And if you do get it unsnagged, just check for frays. Always check for frays when something like that happens. Well, the fish don't really seem to be biting anymore, so I'm gonna make some rice, clean that fish, have some lunch. You know, it's funny, I accidentally put an ant in my mouth and I was wondering what that weird taste was and it tastes exactly like the anise stuff that they put on fishing lures. And I'm also worried I'm just gonna see a mountain lion popping up behind me. It really helps things cook faster if you could find a spot protected from the wind. There we go, when that rice starts to simmer, I'll turn the heat down as low as possible and cover it. Now this is the fastest way to gut and clean your fish and get it ready for cooking. You'll take your knife, go up the butt to just below these two fins there. And then you won't go under the gills, you'll go right in front of them, and cut right by the mouth. Stick your thumb all the way down its throat, grab its head, hold the throat, and when you do that, all the guts come right out. Now the only thing left is the bloodline, and to help remove some more bones, you can take these little fins off. So you can just pick them right off with your hand. That'll make eating the fish a little bit more enjoyable. And you'll break the skin. That's apparently the fish's kidney there. And just scrape it out with your thumb. Or if you have a spoon, you can use that too. And there's your clean fish. Easy, huh? I'm not gonna eat the head and I do need a little bit more room in my frying pan. So I'll cut right behind its neck and then break the spine work it back and forth and the head will come right off. Oh, this is gonna be good. While that rice finishes cooking, I'll be fishing. You know, once you start fishing, it might be really hard to stop. It might take you to dangerous places, all for the chance to catch a fish. After you get comfortable casting, try casting some different ways. It's the only way you'll get better, just trying different things. Oh, fish on! Fish on! Little brown trout. Too small to keep. Let's see how that rice turned out. Oh, that looks good. Salt, black pepper, and garlic powder. If I don't push it down, it'll all curl up. The nice thing about trout is you don't have to scale them. You can eat the scales. Ah. 
I like to cook my trout a little bit longer than I normally would any other fish. I like it a bit more firm, so a good brown on it. Move it to the side. Add my rice to the butter mix. A little more seasoning. Now the best part about trout, you can peel the meat right off the bone. But if I do this right, everything should come off, including the pin bones. Oh man, oh, some pin bones got stuck in the fish, but that's okay. They're so small, you won't even feel them. Yes, oh yes, oh yes. And there you go. It's one of the best parts about going fishing and catching your own fish. You can cook it up and eat it right there on the spot. Mm. Mm. Dang, so good. Well, I covered a lot of the basics on how to fish for trout for beginners. Of course, I can't cover everything. The most important thing is that you get out here, make some mistakes, and learn from your own experience. Now, I can't wait until I can get back to the ocean and build my driftwood raft. Until next time.